Good morning. Our scripture this morning is from Acts 4, verses 13 through 20, and the version that we're reading from is the NIV. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them not to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach in all the, it, at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him, to be judged? At to, are, are you judges? As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Children ages four to six are dismissed downstairs. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here. Good to see you. Um, I feel a little nervous today, which is really strange, having done this for a long time in my life. But coming into this church today, I just feel a little bit nervous. And uh, that's, that's good. It's a good thing. Because um, we need the Lord. We need to depend on the Lord. We'll be talking about that a little later in the service today. Um, I really appreciate the, the invitation. Uh, I've appreciated over the years, of course, uh, working together with various pastors from the Baptist Church. And... Uh, uh, really believe in the importance of churches exchanging pastors once in a while, exposing ourselves to different ministries. We've tried to do that in our church and appreciate the fact that we can do that here today. So I'm really glad to be here. In fact, I can say I'm very glad to be anywhere these days. Um, <laughs> some of you will know that on December 30th, I suffered a heart attack. And on January 8th, I had open heart surgery, triple bypass. I still have the scars. I'll have them for the rest of my life. And uh, on February 1st, I was back preaching. And that, that was, that's good. That was God. Uh, Grant was uh, filling in for us and did a marvelous job. I heard many good reports. I watched online as much as I could. So I really appreciate I really am glad to be anywhere these days. So uh, it's good to be here today. I want to start by showing you three short videos um, we live in a video age, and I like to see videos. I like to watch videos. So I want to show you three short videos. Um, uh, they all talk about being aware of your situation, aware of the situation you find yourself in. The first one is a classic video. Many of you have seen it already. It comes from Edmonton, and it's a news reporter standing on a toboggan hill. Now, most reporters in Canada will know that a, report, a, a, a toboggan coming towards you does not turn. It goes in a straight line. So if you happen to be standing in front of the toboggan, you have a choice to make. You can go left or you can go right. If you stay where you are, well, you'll watch what happens here. I'm rolling. All right, so I've got my trusty stopwatch, and here they come down the hill. It looks like Ruben is in the lead, and here comes oh, oh, Idea. At Riverside Park, Rob what? <laughs> now you think he would have been aware of the situation, but he wasn't. The second video, again a short one, is also a reporter. It says something maybe about the situation in regards to news in our country, and maybe sometimes the people presenting the news aren't as aware as we think they are. This is a reporter conducting an interview on the street. Again, a classic video. You've maybe seen it already, but uh, we'll let it run. Just a short one. You failed to prove it the first time around. You, what do you have up your sleeve to be more successful this time around? Already said I will not be making any comment. Thank you. Oh my God, that hurts. <laughs> Up your 
leave to be more successful this time around. It's possible to be very smart, yet unaware of what's going on around you. Um, yeah, that's just replayed over and over. It's just fun to watch it numerous times. <laughs> <laughs> And the last one we'll watch is actually a test. This is where you get to be involved because most of us think we're pretty aware. Most of you sitting here today say, that would never happen to me. I'm aware completely of my situation. I'm totally aware. I don't know if any of you watch movies at all, but in the Shawshank Redemption story, I don't know if you watch that movie, but uh, the, the uh, warden of the prison was totally unaware of the guy who was planning his escape, totally unaware. He called him obtuse. Let's be honest, some of us are a little obtuse. Uh, here's a, a, a short test for you, and you can get involved in this, and, and this is for you. How aware are you? Here's your challenge. How many riders in green jump the ramps? Go. Five riders in green jumped the ramps. But did you notice the unicyclist? How about the hidden message? Did you see that? Did you notice the man dropping the suspicious backpack? Your next challenge, be aware of your surroundings. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Uh, today we want to talk about the awareness of God, being aware of the presence of God in our lives. Um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a challenge to the disciples and all the people involved because um, they had to become aware of a new reality. The old reality was Jesus was dead. The new reality is Jesus is alive, but they weren't aware of that. And they had to become and get to the place where they were aware of the living presence of Christ. For instance, uh, the women on the way to the tomb. Remember what they were talking about? Who's going to roll the stone away? Unaware completely that the stone was already rolled away. Remember they were bringing spices for the dead body of Jesus? Completely unaware that the body of Jesus was no longer dead. He was alive. Remember Mary in the garden talking to a gardener, asking the gardener, where have you placed Jesus? Completely unaware that she was actually talking to Jesus. Remember the two disciples on the road to Emmaus talking about the events of the weekend and how disturbed they were and how upsetting it was and the rumors about you know, them having stolen the body and maybe he was alive. And they're walking along and they invite this stranger into their house and he prays and suddenly they realize that was Jesus. They were totally unaware of the presence of Jesus in their life that day. And you know the story that for uh, six weeks, um, Jesus appeared to his disciples over and over and over again. The Bible says for 40 days, he appeared to his disciples, proving to them with many convincing proofs that he was alive because they had to become aware of the living presence of God. Wherever they went, Jesus was. They went fishing, there he was. They're in a locked room, there he is. Everywhere they go, he's there. And at first, they're not aware of it. Remember um, Peter fishing, and uh, they come in after an all-night of fishing. They haven't caught anything. There's somebody standing on the shore, says, put your nets on the other side. Seems like a strange request, but he's heard it once before. He does it, and they catch a big load of fish, and somebody says to him, it's Jesus. He didn't realize that it was Jesus. Everywhere they went for six weeks, Jesus appears to them and proves himself to be alive. They even watch as he ascends back into heaven. You can imagine standing there watching him go up and suddenly they're aware of two angels standing beside him and they say, what are you looking at? He's coming back. He's coming back. 
On the seventh week after the resurrection, something happened. We call it the day of Pentecost. Last week, if you recall, and you know your church history, last week you'll know that last week was the day of Pentecost, and uh, your church may have observed that and and, uh, talked about that a little bit. Something happened, a spiritual experience unlike anything they'd ever witnessed before. Um, One day alone, one day alone, their church went from 120 to 3,000. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. And that means there's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. Sometimes just having one or two new families in church is a lot of work. Can you imagine having all of a sudden 3,000 people you've got to look after? And you've got to disciple, and you've got to teach, and you've got to encourage, and you've got to be an example to them. You've got to do all those things. And so for some time now, they have had the job of making disciples out of these new believers. You know, you spend time daily praying with them, meeting with them in the temple, eating together, studying together. It's intense. It's very busy. But let me ask you a question. How aware are you of the presence of Christ today, seven, eight weeks after Easter? Easter is a grand time in our church, isn't it? It's, it's always fun to have Easter when we talk about the resurrection of Jesus and the presence of God in our lives. But how aware are you today of the living presence of God in your life? How aware are you? Do you make yourself aware that God is with you, God is near you? Or Has your relationship or your religion become a little humdrum, a little routine? Just you're going through the motions. Are you still amazed by him or has it become rather casual? Um, Today I want to take a look at one day in the life of the disciples, approximately eight, nine weeks, maybe ten weeks. I'm not really sure of the time frame. One week in the life of the disciples after the resurrection, or one day I should say, And uh, it happens in the book of Acts chapter 3. And we read a little bit from Acts chapter 4. And you'll see some scriptures up here. Let me read the story for you very quickly just to give you some context. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. No, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said to him, look at us. And the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. What I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This day starts with a man getting ready to go to work. Um, It's something he's done his entire life. Um, It's not something he did as a result of going to college. It's not something he did as a result of having an apprenticeship. It's something he did out of necessity. You see, his job was sitting begging for money. That was his job. They took him to the temple every day where he would sit and beg for money. I don't think it's something he wanted to do. I think it's an understanding this is what he had to do. If he could do anything to change his situation, he would have changed the situation. I asked myself, and as I, I read this story over again, I wonder how old he was the first time his parents or somebody took him to the temple gate. You ever think of that? He's 40 years old now. I wonder when the first time was that they took him to the temple. Was he 12? Was he 13? Was he 18? When dad said to him, you got to start carrying your load. you got to start helping us around here. We need your help. We can't support you. It's time for you to go to work. And they took him and dropped him off at the temple gate where he spent the day begging people for money. He hoped for a smile. He hoped for some act of kindness. He probably hoped for somebody to give him a gift. That's what he was there for. If he could have done anything to change his situation, he would have. This was just another day, another chance to just go to work, another chance just to go through the motions and go through the routines. You know, 
There are people just like this man in our town. Have you seen them? You may see them in a store behind a till. Oh, they're not sitting on the street begging. I'm not talking about that. But they're people who are caught in situations every day of their lives they wish could be changed. Every day they wish that something could change in their life. It's the same old, same old, same old routine, and nothing ever changes. There's a sense of hopelessness in their life. Nothing's going to change. Sometimes it's people who are sick, and they wish to anything they could be better. Sometimes it's people caught in a marriage situation, and they wish to anything it could change, it could be better. I've known people like this. You've known people like this. And we see them all over the place. They're not just in the workplace. They're sometimes at school. I remember a kid that I went to school with, absolutely the best athlete in the school. He was the top dog. Everybody loved him. He made all-star teams, all-city teams. He was a great football player, basketball player, track, everything. He was the best. Girls loved him. Everybody loved him. I met him years after school, many years after school. We sat and we met and uh, had coffee together. And he told me, Dave, he says, what you didn't know is that my dad was an alcoholic. I was never, ever good enough for my dad. Every touchdown I got, I could have had two more. Every basket I shot could have been better. I could have played better game. I came home every time from a game, and my dad would beat me, and my dad would say, you could have done better. You could have been a better player. I didn't know that. I went to school with this kid in Ontario. We had five years of high school. I went to school with him for five years. I never knew he was going through that. All I saw was the outside which seemed so successful, seemed so good. Another girl I went to school with, I didn't realize it at the time, but in grade nine, her mother and her sister were in a horrific car accident. The mother became a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down, unable to move. This girl in grade nine had her father come home one day from work, throw, her che throw his check on the table, and say, you're now the woman of the house. All my years of high school, we graduated together. I never knew that story. Here was a girl at home. Her situation was never going to change. And she was faced with that every day. There are people in your life, there are people in our community who wish for anything that the situation could change, totally unaware of the presence of God, totally unaware that today was going to be a different day. He sat asking for alms. Years ago, I heard a preacher, and I shouldn't say this because I don't have it in my notes, and I promised, because I, the last number of times I've talked about this message, I, I've refused to say it, but I'll, I'll say it for you guys today. He asked for alms and got legs. <laughs> I said I wasn't going to say it, but I would. There are people around us every day of our lives that are wishing, hoping that the situation could change that they find themselves in, and it never changes. And they're completely unaware of the presence of God. Peter and John were a little unaware as well. Um, these are the apostles. They're busy. Man, they're busy. It's, it, it, it must have been so busy for them to go from 120 to 3,000 people. They're doing everything they can to look after these people. They've got meetings every day. They're eating out every day at various people's homes. They're baptizing people. They're teaching them. They've got lessons, and they're going to prayer. This happens to be going on their way to a prayer meeting at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The Bible's very specific about what's going on. And they are just on their way to prayer. They're very busy and I wonder what went through their minds as they walked past the man who had been sitting at the gate. I wonder what they thought. I wonder what they thought when the guy held out his basket or held out his tin cup or whatever he held out and asked them for money. I wonder what was going through their minds. I wonder if they thought of the story that Jesus told of the Good Samaritan. Remember when the priest rushed by? Remember when the Levite rushed by? And they passed the guy in need, and they said nothing to him. And Jesus told them the story of the Samaritan who stopped and helped. I wonder if they thought of that story that day. I wonder if they thought of themselves as the priest or as the Levite rushing by on their way to church and forgetting all about the man who was in need. 
I wonder what they were thinking. Whatever they were thinking, Peter and John suddenly became aware of a person with a need. And they're now confronted with a thought, what are we going to do? Listen, this has probably happened to you at some point in time. You've been rushing through life and suddenly you're confronted with a person who has a need. It may be sitting over coffee and they start start telling you their story and in the back of your mind, you're thinking, what am I going to do? What can I do about this situation? What am I going to do? And that's what they're thinking. What are we going to do? And they ask Peter and John for money. You know the story. They didn't have any money. But what they did have, they would give him in the name of Jesus. Suddenly, Peter and John become aware of Jesus in a new light. Remember, they're on their way to a Bible study. And suddenly, they become aware of the presence of God. Here's a man with a need that's so much bigger than anything they could do. There's no way they could help this man with what they had. So they said, in the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. What would you have given that man that day? I'm sure if Peter and John had money, they would have given him money, but they had no money. They must have been Pentecostals, right? Uh, No money. (laughs) They had no money, but what we do have we'll give you in the name of Jesus. Stand and walk. What would you give somebody that's in need today? I'm sure if you had money, you'd give them. But some of the situations that you face and that I face are so much bigger than just giving somebody a check or giving somebody some cash. They're so much bigger than that. Please don't say you would have had nothing to give. Because I remind you today that the living presence of Christ is in you. I remind you today that the Holy Spirit is in you. I remind you that God has equipped you supernaturally to give to people things that you don't have in the physical world. Please don't say, I could never have done that. Because you have the living power of God in you. And they had to think, what are we going to give this man? You know the story. The man was expecting nothing. Same old, same old. A bunch of religious people that day had passed him on their way to the temple. Why would Peter and John be any different? He wasn't expecting anything. He certainly wasn't expecting to meet God. I don't know that Peter and John were expecting anything differently. But all of a sudden, that man stood up, and he's walking and leaping and praising God, and he's excited because something's going on in his life that's never, ever happened before. He's never walked a day in his life. Can you imagine that? He's never walked a day in his life. The people in the temple weren't expecting much to happen either. We read about them in the story. It says that there were people in the temple that obviously were there for the prayer meeting. And suddenly there comes a guy who's walking and leaping and praising God. And the Bible says they recognized him as the man who used to sit at the gate. They came in and said, that's the guy that we just passed by a few minutes ago. What's he doing in church? What's he doing leaping and jumping and praising God? That doesn't go on in church. You don't do those things in church. That's not how you act in church. We act reserved and, and you know, steady and, and, and you know, we, we don't get too excited. But here's this guy who's experienced the power of God in ways that he had never experienced before and they're seeing it for the first time and all of a sudden they're amazed, the Bible says. They're in wonder, they're in awe as they thought of the guy that they had passed by on their way to the prayer meeting. (laughs) Do you remember when Jesus was teaching one time? He was teaching about the sheep and the goats and how at the end of time, people would be judged and on one half, people would go to heaven and the other half, people would be excluded from heaven. And... Do you remember what Jesus said in the story was the determining factor? Do you remember? He said, "Um, when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you gave me something to wear. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. And the people who were going into heaven said, when did we see you naked? When did we see you in jail? 
And Jesus said to them, Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. I wonder if the people at the prayer meeting, when they were thinking of that 40-year-old man who had been there every day begging, I wonder if they thought of that verse. Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. What do you think about when you go into Brandon or Winnipeg and the guy's standing at the corner as the intersection with a sign, what do you think about when you know he's asking you for money? What do you think about? Do you think about the least of these, my brethren? Or do you just rush on past, go on and do your thing? You're busy. You've got an appointment. You've got, to, you've got to go someplace. Not much different than the priest or the Levite. Even the non-religious people in this story are interested. Not the people in the temple, but the Bible says that all the people got excited and they started gathering at a place called Solomon's Colonnade. All the people who were just hanging around saw the commotion and they saw what's going on and they gathered together. You know the most amazing thing you, we, we see in our community is when God does something in a, in a person's life, there are people in our community who are, do have no interest in God whatsoever. They have no interest in God. But when God does something in somebody's life, they pay attention. They know a change has taken place. They can't explain it. They may question it. They may doubt your faith. But they know God's done something. Something's happened. And they come together and they gather around. They come from all over excited because they don't fully understand it. But something's going on. Suddenly, even skeptical people become aware of the presence of God. Of course, the most interesting people that day that suddenly become aware of the presence of God are the religious people, the religious leaders. They're kind of amazed. They look at what's going on. They see this man walking and leaping. And they don't understand it. And they begin to ask questions like, who gave you authority to do this? These are men who have talked about the law. They've talked about forgiveness. They've talked about keeping all the restrictions of the law. Who gave you authority to do this? By what power do you do these things? Suddenly, they became aware of God in a way that they had never become aware of God before. Their religion had just become routine, dull, just go through the motions, teach the people. They had never experienced the power of God. They experienced religion, but they didn't experience Jesus. And suddenly, they become aware of Jesus' presence. There are people like that in our community. They know about Jesus. They'll tell us that we should be like Jesus. We should forgive like Jesus. We should act like Jesus. We should talk like Jesus. But to know that he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own, they don't know that. They don't know the living presence of God. They don't know that Jesus is a present reality. They talk about past history, but they don't know the present reality of Jesus in their lives but they're getting a crash course in it this day. By what authority do you do this? Let me ask you a serious question. Has anybody asked you that lately? I asked myself that. And the bottom line answer is they don't ask us because they don't see us doing much. We're just going through religious motions. They're not seeing people walking and leaping and all excited. They're not asking us, by what authority do you do this? Because frankly, we're not doing much. And it's a challenge to us. People don't ask us those questions anymore because the kind of thing that happened this day required something that was way beyond religion, way beyond something that the board can do sitting around a table. This is God. This is God at work. Suddenly they're aware of the presence of God. But they became aware of Jesus that day. You say, how? Well, they looked at Peter and John. They looked at Peter and John, and things just didn't make sense. It said, these men are unschooled, 
ignorant, ordinary men. They should not be able to do what they're doing. But they took note that they had been with Jesus. They took note that they had been with Jesus. Let me ask you the question again. It's a tough question. And by the way, I just want to remind you, I wouldn't preach anything here at this church that I wouldn't preach also in my own church. And some weeks ago, I preached a message very similar to this to our church. So I'm asking the same questions I asked our people. Has anybody taken note lately, looking at your life, that you've spent time with Jesus? There's something different about you because you've been spending time with Jesus. You've been spending time with him. There's an authority and a power in your life that they don't understand because you're ignorant and ordinary people. That's what we are. When we get to thinking that it's us, we're in real problems. We have real problems. When we get to thinking that we're so good, that people come to us because we're so good, we've got it all together, we're in a really sad shape because it's not us. We're ignorant, ordinary people. But we've been with Jesus. And that makes all the difference in the world. Have you been spending time with Jesus? And has he been making a difference in your life? On this day, two busy disciples become aware of the living presence of Christ. A man living with no hope becomes aware of the life-giving presence of Jesus. Believers who never expected anything to happen in their worship time suddenly became aware of the great possibilities of Jesus in their midst. Outsiders, skeptics, unbelievers, they may not have understood, they may have doubted, they may have questioned, but suddenly they were aware that this isn't the church that I'm used to. Jesus is here. Religious leaders suddenly aware that all their teaching, all their, relig- all their rituals mean nothing when you spend time with Jesus. Weeks from now, in a year from now, how aware will you be of the presence of Jesus? I've been spending a lot of time talking about this. And a lot of times, Jesus reminds us over and over and over again. Um, If two or three of you gather together in my name, there am I in the midst. You don't need a big crowd to experience the presence of Christ. Are you aware of the presence of Christ in your small little gatherings? He's here. Remember when Jesus said, and sometimes it's maybe seen as a bit of a negative thing, but remember when Jesus said, that the things that you whisper in your house will one day be shouted from the housetops? Are you aware of the living presence of Christ in your conversations? That he listens to the things you say? He hears what you say about other people? He's with us. He's here. He's just as real today as he was that day in Jerusalem. I think of it so many times, and there's so many things that just floods my heart. Remember way back in the Old Testament when they threw three Hebrew men into a fiery furnace? They thought they were in full control. The king thought he was in control of everything, but he was unaware of the fourth man. He was unaware of the fourth man. Didn't we throw three people in? Why are there four people in the fire? And they're unbound, and they're unhurt, and they're walking around. Where did he come from? (laughs) That's what people will be asking about you when you spend time with Jesus. Where did he come from? Where did Jesus come from? All of a sudden, they become aware of the presence of God in your life because you're aware of the presence of God in your life. There used to be a song that we sang in our church. I don't know if, if, if you sang it in this church years ago. It's an old one. And the words are there. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. All things are possible. Jesus is here. I was brought up singing that church, that song in church. Many times after a sermon like this, the song leader would lead, Jesus is here. 
Jesus is here. All things are possible. Jesus is here. You see, when Jesus is present, anything's possible. Men who have never walked before can suddenly go walking and leaping and praising God. People who have lived in despair in their lives, suddenly their lives are turned around. They're filled with hope. They don't understand where it came from or how it came. They just met with some people who were ordinary, ignorant people who had spent time with Jesus. Makes all the difference in the world. All the difference in the world. So I want to encourage you today. Uh, Again, just shortly uh, after we, uh, just shortly before we moved from from Killarney the first time, moved to Alberta, a song had just come out, and uh, it became my favorite song for for many years. And uh, we used to sing it often in our church in Alberta. And again, it's very similar to what we just sang. It says, he is here, hallelujah. He is here, amen. He is here, listen closely. Hear him calling out your name. I just want to remind you today that Jesus is present. Jesus is here today. I'm not sure what you're facing. I'm not sure what challenges you're facing, but Jesus is here. He wants to move in your life. He wants to move in your heart. Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe it's a health situation. Maybe it's a financial situation. I don't know what it is. But Jesus is just as real here today as he was on the streets of Jerusalem back many years ago. Just as real. And he can still change lives. And by the way, he's going to be with you tomorrow and on Tuesday and the day after that. When you walk down the street, when you go to the classroom, when you walk into the office, Jesus goes with you because he's in you. Remember what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit? He's not only going to be with you, but he's going to be in you. Makes all the difference in the world. Amen? Amen. I want you to become very aware of the presence of God. Make yourself aware. Sometimes he shows up when we're in trouble like the three Hebrew boys. Sometimes he shows up when we're fishing. And there he is. Didn't expect him. Sometimes he shows up when you lock yourself away and you want no one else around you. And all of a sudden, there he is. He's with you all the time. A number of weeks ago, I asked the kids in the question, when I was speaking about this, maybe seven weeks ago I talked about this, I asked them the question, do you think Jesus just showed up those, those times or was he there all the time? And one of the smallest kids in the church said, he was there all the time. We just weren't aware of him. And the reality is, he's there all the time. Whether you're aware of him or not, he's there. Let's pray together. Father, help us to become more aware of your presence. We don't have to ask for you to come. You said you would never leave us nor forsake us. You said you would never leave us alone. You're always there. So, Father, I thank you today for your presence here in this place. There are people here today who need to call out to you for a miracle in their lives, whatever it may be, a family situation, a friend that needs salvation, whatever it is, Father, they need Jesus, and we need you. We need you to help us. We need you to give us words to say. We need you to give us the courage and the boldness to speak up for you. Father, may we not be like the disciples who were commanded not to talk about you, but they refused to give in to that command. They said, we're going to keep talking about you. Help us to continue talking about Jesus because you make the difference in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can I just close on that one thought before the worship team comes back? They told them not to talk about Jesus. Now, we live in a country, nobody will tell us that today. But some of you here today have been in situations where you've had opportunity to talk about Jesus and you've been embarrassed You say, well, I don't want to put pressure on anybody. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Maybe I'll invite them to church, but I won't really talk about Jesus. Can I just remind you, as I tell our people, church doesn't change anybody. Jesus does. And if you're not going to talk about Jesus, you've just erased all power that you have because the power is not in you. Remember ignorant and ordinary people who've been with Jesus? The power is with Jesus. So let's keep talking about them. Let's make efforts. Put yourself in situations where you can talk. I said today I was a little nervous. One of the ways we become aware of Jesus is we put ourselves 
in awkward situations that we've never been before. And suddenly we become aware, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I'm nervous, not because I've never preached before, but I realize it's a different situation and I need Jesus today. You need Jesus. Put yourself in a situation, open up a conversation, talk to somebody about the living Lord. He's still alive today and he still changes lives. God bless you. with us as we close in song this morning. Thank you so much, Pastor Dave. Oh